All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending today and our uh, first inaugural webinar with the What Does Innovation Mean series in your industry. Today, we'll be focusing on the AEC space. We have an awesome all-star panel here for you today. Uh, I'll let those gentlemen introduce themselves in just a second. But uh, for today, I will be your host, Justin Parnell with Bright Idea. Um, and with no further ado, let's get over to our panelists. Hey everybody, it's uh, Ryan Fletcher with Black and Beach. Um, I'm the Vice President of our Innovation Team. Great to be with you today. Awesome, and I'm uh, Hamza Shambari, Director of Innovation at Haskell. I'm Koshal Dewan. I uh, work with DPR Construction. I'm also part of our corporate venture arm, WD Ventures. Uh, lead our uh, strategic investments and partnerships for the company. Awesome, thanks so much for the introductions, guys. and. Uh, thanks so much for participating in this conversation today. Again, this is a topic that's uh, super uh, relevant right now for a lot of the folks in your industry. So really appreciate you sharing your insights and, um, and, and advice for everyone. But uh, given that innovation is a very uh, big term and has different context, uh, given your audience, um, we wanted to know what it really means to innovate in the AEC space in 2022. Um, I know that you all have uh, been in this space for quite a while, running your innovation teams, and would love to hear uh, the current state of things and, and kind of where you see things going in the future. So Ryan, I don't know if uh, you want to get us started with um, with your point of view, but would, would love to hear it. Yeah, happy to, Justin. Um... I mean, the great thing about innovation, it's always changing, right? So, uh, I mean, so we've been uh, active in our group for about six years now and um, had a pretty good stride going and then certainly COVID threw us a curveball. Um, and I, I think the innovation team became very reactive to what was happening with COVID. We did do a lot of things. We continue to be involved in sort of uh, responding and helping with the pandemic in ways that we can. Uh, but for 2022, I'm excited to sort of look uh, get back to sort of long-term challenges, uh, big, big world problems. Uh, so we're doing a lot right now with climate change, um, thinking forward into the future, five, 10, 15 years, what sort of transformation that's going to cause, um, you know, and what sort of opportunities is that going to create? Uh, certainly a lot of problems, but, um, from an AEC perspective, I think a lot of opportunities for firms here to help with climate change and mitigating its impacts. Cool. So you think that now in the post COVID world, we might be getting back to some of those real big meaty projects that maybe took a back burner um, when COVID hit and kind of disrupted everything. Yeah, we, we certainly are. I mean, there's there's the climate change and then there's also sort of the um, uh, the sort of the, the near term problems of, you know, how do you make uh, construction more efficient, and productive and things, things of that sort that are like, you know, what are, what are the problems that are keeping people up at night? Um, that, yep. that haven't didn't go away with COVID and remain right. Got it. Yeah. No, I think that that's definitely a trend that's uh, that's taking place right now. But uh, Hamza, I know you have some uh, stories from COVID that you'd like to share, and how how you guys are pivoting coming out of things as well. Um, Want to share your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me here. Uh, uh, the innovation program in Haskell started in like 2018. Uh, and we quickly kind of, you know, hit brick walls, so to say, because, you know, everybody's still kind of entrenched into their ways. They want to try new things, new methods. Uh, there is no really need to go digital, right? Uh, or look at all these different technologies that enable you to, to see, you know, the model in the field or interact with anybody else in the, in the office for that matter. But then COVID hit and actually, it was it was kind of a positive thing in the innovation side because now everybody's like, hey, wait a minute, you actually talked to me two two years ago about this thing that that allows me to communicate with somebody remotely that they don't have to travel all the way over here to see um, what's going on in the job site. So that that part of it was was also exciting to see um, and drive some of those you know initiatives that that not haven't moved before COVID, right? And then they became a necessity. Um, and now everybody wants to do them and and now it's it's the norm so we love that yeah that's super interesting so you saw an acceleration from covid of a lot of initiatives that maybe didn't get the love that they needed before so yeah. 
Um, that's a really cool perspective. And I know, Kashal, you have some thoughts from the DPR side as well. Your program's been around a little little longer, but yeah, what, is, uh, what does innovation mean now uh, and going forward for you guys? Yeah, uh, thank you again, Justin, and echo a lot what these guys are saying here. Uh, you know, we've, we've had our program since uh, 2011, you know, and, and the goal for our program was to just simply capture ideas, you know, things that are happening on our job sites in these pockets of innovation and try to share them across the company. Um, you know, back then there weren't that many startups that, you know, were knocking on our door, so to speak. And today, you know, fast forward to today, I, I think that it's there's been a huge wave of not only external investments, but also startup activity to where there's a lot of solutions that are out there. Right. And so to innovate yeah. in 2022, you know, I think what's different now is that we you have to kind of hone in and say, OK, what is the problem that you're really trying to solve? Right. And how do you you know create that discipline and that framework that allows your people to experiment and try new things? And so that's in my my perspective that that's what it you know means to innovate in 2022. So yeah, a bit of a paradigm shift from just sourcing solutions all the time, but more considering those uh, opportunities for the right things to solve. So um, that's a that's a natural evolution that we hear a lot of, and and really really exciting that your program's moving in that direction. Um, so this is a similar question. I think you guys all kind of uh, hit on it a bit, but. I, I'm curious what success specifically success looks like in 2022 versus what success might have looked like three to five years ago for your programs. Um, and yeah, Ryan, I think uh, you had a, a good point you wanted to bring up around what things looked like um, your first two to three years and kind of what success is is looking like these days. Yeah, I think with a lot of new innovation teams, it's, um, I mean, learning is so much about it innovation is so much about learning right so and as a team you got to kind of learn the the processes and um, the methods that work within your organization our first couple of years uh, we were trying to do a lot of things and we still do with new business model development and that takes a long time to really see if it catches fire uh, it's not like you know going out and trying a new drone and seeing if it actually flies right um, so in this first couple of years, it was really just about like sort of getting that experimental mentality, the sort of uh, ability to fail and fail fast and, and getting that in. But now that we've learned those lessons, I, I think we have a better idea of what we're, we're good at, what we're not good at. And so success to me today means like, OK, now that we've learned those lessons, how do you apply them so that you can scale results faster? Because, um, I mean, there's only so much like I can't imagine an annual report where somebody's like, well, we learned a lot this year, right? And you just learn year over year, right? At some point, people want results. That's <laughs> it's only so much tolerance for learning. Yeah, no, we can we can always learn forever, right? And I think it's uh, taking those learnings and translating them into real life results is another natural evolution of programs. Um, one of the insights that you mentioned was pretty interesting with regards to you started out uh, considering business model transformation um, and you learned that that takes quite a while. Any advice for anybody out there that might be uh, experiencing the same thing when they start their innovation program? Um, what would be a tip you have for maybe setting expectations around that kind of innovation? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, it, it's just, uh, I think, acknowledge how challenging it can be, uh, you know, when you have like an accounting department that's used to like sending out invoices in a certain way and you ask them to like do how to deal with like microtransactions, right? They're like, well, we could create an invoice for like 35 cents, right? <laughs> no, please don't do that. Um, so yeah, um, it's just like being up, acknowledging up front the challenges. And, and sometimes what, what I've been doing lately is I go to people that I need their help from. And I want to just say, like, pretend you don't work at this company, right? Pretend you don't work at Black & Beach. You know, how would you approach this in the right way, right? What would be the, how would Uber do it? You know, how would Elon Musk do it, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, get rid of the shackles of the organization you're in. And I, th I think that helps, like, reset their innovation framework. Nice. Yeah, that's a really great tip. Get those fresh eyes. Pretend like you're you're brand new to the company. Um, that perspective can be really, really helpful. So, um, uh, Koshal, you had a few tips as well for uh, what success looked like pre-COVID and what success looks like now uh, for your innovation program. would love to hear a bit more about uh, your learnings. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what would Elon Musk do? He would buy Twitter. That's what he would do. I, I don't know if he would buy Twitter, but, um, you know, I, I think the thing about innovation, right, is it, it evolves very rapidly, right? It's something that you have to constantly keep up. And for a thriving innovation program, you have to almost reinvent yourself, you know, and this cycle, it seems to be like every two to three years. And a lot of this is dependent on the type of solutions that are out there, the type of market conditions that are out there, right? What fosters this kind of thinking and this type of creativity outside of our doors? Um, you know, as I mentioned early on, you know, in our company, the there weren't that many solution providers. There weren't that many startups back when we first started. But today, you know, you're probably talking about three to five times more the number of vendors that are out there. So it's a very good chance that if you're looking for a solution, you might have three or four competitors for that same solution doing exactly the same thing. So then, then you have to beg yourself and ask the question, like with, with so many solutions out there, you know, it, it's really important to understand the problem that you're trying to solve, right? And sometimes yeah. these solutions only tackle a symptom of the problem and not the big problem itself. And so for us, success, what that looks like is basically saying, okay, what is that problem that we're trying to solve? Ask the five whys and understand, is this truly solving a problem or is it just addressing a symptom? And so that's something that we're focused on going forward. Great. Yeah. And for those of us that aren't uh, knowledgeable about the five whys, what are the five whys? <laughs> it's basically just asking the same question. Why? You know, five yep. times, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's really that simple. And what it does is by the time you get to the third or the fourth one, you're like, eh, is this really, you know, something that we need to do and take on, right? And it really gets down to the to nitty gritty, you know, uh, bottom. Nice. Yeah, no, I uh, wanted everyone at home to know how easy it is to do the five whys. Just keep asking. <laughs> it's that simple. Don't get annoyed, but just keep asking. Um, and then Hamza, I think you had uh, something to add there too about uh, commercial uh, grade solutions and being able to apply those. So we'd love to hear your insights. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, if anybody who has like a two-year-old, they know what the five whys actually look like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back to like the same, the same, uh, I would concur with everything Kashal just, just mentioned, which is like, you know, finding those um, actual problem statements, right? What, what are we trying to solve for? Because before when we started, you know, we we're, were chasing, you know, the, the shiny, objects the coolest thing that are out there and we're saying oh yeah this this is cool let's let's test it out and we go to the job site or, or the office here with design build and we say hey this is a great solution let's let's put it to the test let's check it out um and you know you're, you're just trying to push innovation trying to push technologies on the people where we stopped doing that you know right around the, the time when COVID hit uh i started taking another approach which is like let let them pull those solutions out from from us, right? So we're talking all these startups, we're talking all these technology companies, um, logging them in, in our structured database and actually seeing what what the problem statement they're solving for. And then when somebody comes to us, like a project manager, superintendent, whoever it is, and says, you know, I have this specific problem. Do you have any solutions that can help me um, identify and, and solve for it? Um, so that that's kind of the first step, which is kind of getting them getting their buy-in before you even introduce the technology to them. Yep. But then the second part of it, which is I think is more important, is having what we call an implementation plan. This is it's a written plan about what the technology is, what we're trying to do, what the timeline is, who the champions are. Uh, but then the the most important part of it, which is what is the success criteria, right? So if somebody comes to me says I have this problem. I'm like, all right, well here's three solutions that you can test out. But what would you like to see? What does success look like to you? And have that written so you know we're all on the same page nobody's kind of understanding things differently interesting yeah that's a that's a really great build um upon what they're doing at dpr but i think like being able to diagnose uh that that issue right and then uh add on and layer on the scoped out success criteria for what a successful solution or implementation would look like it's a great tip um That'll keep you out of a lot of trouble, I think, for uh, people just getting started, be able to scope out exactly what your success will look like um, and get buy in and alignment from from your uh, stakeholders. So um, moving on to another question that I think is is really top of mind for a lot of uh, your peers and innovation practitioners out there. 
But uh, what are some of the trends that you're watching um, in the AEC space with regards to innovation programs and innovation program evolution? Um, and Hamza, I think you had uh, some really cool trends that you wanted to, to bring up today. <laughs> yeah, I always I always shout it off rooftops. Robots. I was getting <laughs> yeah. excited about robots. Um, <laughs> robotics are, are, are an interesting trend to, to keep looking at just because, you know, they are really increasing efficiencies, increasing safety on the job site, increasing quality, right? Depending on the robot that you're getting, of course. Uh, right now, they're not the best at, at doing those, but they are progressively getting better and faster and more efficient. Uh, so that's that's a, a very, very important trend to keep an eye on. And it's not necessarily something that, you know, takes takes away jobs. It's, it's something that, you know, takes away the dull, dirty and dangerous jobs so that, you know, our workers and labor force can can do things more productively in, in, in a higher level um, environments. Yeah, I think that's a really great point to uh, bring up, too, about uh, robots. They're not necessarily going to take all the jobs away. I think they're going to take away jobs, like you said, that are those dull, dirty, dangerous, uh, the 3Ds that you all are always trying to improve and solve for. So uh, don't be afraid. The robots are coming. They're coming to help. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, Kashal, I think, um, what are some trends that you're watching in the industry right now? Yeah, I'm surprised, Hamza, you didn't say Skynet was coming. You know, I, I was just <laughs> waiting for that one. But, uh, you know, when it comes to trends, it's we we take a look at, again, what's happening outside. And then also what are some of the pilots that we're taking on internally in the company? You know, we do about 50 to 60 pilots a year, which is a lot. Right. And the way we get there is we empower our folks to take these pilots on themselves and folks on the innovation team are not leading the pilots. So this what that does is helps us you know, have like a, a critically thinking organization and people that are empowered to kind of try things. Right. So in a lot of words, you know, we we focused uh, uh, on three different areas. We focused on IOT, robotics is another one, and then field innovation, uh, something that's a, a near you know, uh, term trend for us and, and also an increased focus is uh, reality capture. Um, you know, we, we touched on the topic of robotics and how it's not there to, to take over jobs, which is very important, you know, to to emphasize because, you know, it, it to say that a robot's going to take a job, it almost, you know, creates a sense of fear, right? That you're going to lose your job and, and you got to go find something else. But the reality is, you know, the concept of co-bots, you know, CO bots is, is something that that might actually, you know, happen. And then that basically means is how do you work alongside a robot that helps you do a job versus a robot doing your job completely? Uh, on the IoT side, you know, we're looking at things like job site security and access control in addition to, you know, tools and, and uh, equipment tracking and usage. Um, yeah, with field innovation, we're connecting more, you know, with our craft to create an inclusive environment for them to try new things and experiment. And then the last piece, reality capture, you know, trying to find solutions that are able to, you know, uh, help us achieve a higher level of quality in our projects. Um, so those are some of the focus areas for us. That's super cool. And one of the things that I think is most powerful about what you said is you run 50 to 60 POCs a year. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that will be listening to this that will want to know how you accomplish that and how um, you got the buy-in to empower people to run those POCs. Um, you want to walk us through that process and and maybe how you're you're able to do that at DPR? Sure. sure. Yeah. So our program, the way it's set up, we have dedicated regional innovation leads. And so what these leads do is they support, you know, multiple business units within a region. So we have an East Coast leader. We have a West Coast leader. We have a central leader. And each one of these leads support somewhere between, you know, seven to 10 business units and all the employees that work within those business units. And so our model focuses on creating a network of volunteer innovators within these business units. So each business unit has somewhere between three to seven innovation core groups. Um, and then these core groups are the ones that take on these pilots. So if we do our job well by supporting these people, teaching them the techniques of design thinking and how to frame a pilot, it allows us to not only support them, but be allowed, you know, allowed us to take on, you know, 50 to 60 pilots a year. So. You know, we provide awesome. them funding, we provide them coaching, you know, connect them to the other folks that are in the company that are also doing the same thing. And, and so that's that's how we do it. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And I know so many people out there want to scale and they just, you know, want to know what that model looks like and how best to go about it. So thanks for sharing that tip. And then, yeah, Ryan, um, I'm sure there's some trends you're watching out there in the industry as well. What are what are you uh, most excited about? Oh, I'm most excited about Kashal's like POC <laughs> program and wondering how we can sign up for that because that's yes. yeah, that is amazing. I, I think that structure having the regional leads is uh, great. Um, I wish we had something like that. We're not we're not really organized regionally, which is kind of, kind of our challenge. Um, but yeah, yeah, just to like pile on robots. Um, <laughs> That's certainly an interest to us. Um, uh, we've done work with Built Robotics. They're autonomous excavators. Uh, Honda working on a, you know, a all-terrain vehicle, basically a, a four-wheeler that's autonomous. Um, and so those have been really fun and a, a good learning experience, I think, for, for both companies. The the thing too about robots that that I wanted to add is it's not just so much like, hey, you have this robot doing this task, and now it, you know um you know it, it saves money or it's more safe or, or whatever it's like how do you scale that and then how do you build it into the rest of the, the processes i mean something like safety comes up you know first and foremost right away uh but how do our like business development and proposal estimating teams figure out like okay how many when am i going to get the robots how much time are they going to be doing what tasks you know how do you fit them into a schedule you know the dependencies how do you, as a construction manager, sort of manage all that, moving robots around and things like that? It's all this other stuff uh, that needs to happen that goes along with it to sort of really, uh, really get the full advantage of that. And, and then if you do something like nighttime construction, um, you know, how that how's that really going to work? Um, it's a lot of really interesting things. I think we're really just at the tip of the iceberg with robots, hopefully in a positive way. Um, the, the other one that we're spending a lot of time on is um, AI and ML um, on data. Um, particularly visual data, uh, which goes to things like the reality capture uh, that was mentioned is sort of like, you know, it's it's great to have more cameras and sensors and, you know, ways to capture all this data from job sites, but unless you have some efficient way to like uh, process that information and make intelligent decisions from it, it's it's just like, it's, it's overwhelming, right? So um, now there's, we've been working on that for five years and I'm still really looking for like, the silver bullet there, the great application where that really like delivers on the promise that you know everybody hopes it does. Uh, but um, definitely a trend to watch for us. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Uh, I think all of us are drowning in data, regardless of our industry these days. And um, yeah, if you find that sil silver bullet, let us know. <laughs> I think everyone will be interested in hearing that um, for another session. But. Uh, one of the things that I think, and pivoting to another topic here, is really interesting about the AEC space and this group uh, here on this call in particular, is how you all have been able to develop cross-business innovation partnerships over the last few years. Um, and then I'd love to hear uh, how you guys see those partnerships uh, going forward. Um, specifically with regards to your uh, next coalition that I believe, uh, Ryan, you were you were one of the founders of. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear why has this approach been so successful in the AEC space and um, how do you guys see things uh, transforming going forward? Yeah, as I mentioned, when COVID hit, uh, our innovation team really went into reactive mode and trying to figure out like everywhere we could help. Um, we put out a call to startups for COVID solutions and it's, you know, it was everything from like, you know, persistent hand sanitizer to walking through like booths and temperature monitors and things like that. We had like 300 people respond in like three or four weeks wow. and it was just an overwhelming amount of stuff. It was like kind of everything we've been talking about, like way too many solutions to deal with and we're like, this is, you know, in the construction industry, safety is top of mind for all construction firms. I mean, that's, you're not going to be in business if it's not. Um, and so we were all, I think, facing the same challenges of like, how do you just keep our people safe? How do you keep job sites running? How do you, you know, counter this uh, disease? Um, and I, I don't really quite recall the conversation, but at some point, Kashal and I were talking about this. And uh, it may have been Kashal's idea to like spread it to the world. I, I, don't, I don't know, but <laughs> it, it turned into um, the next coalition because it's like, you know, 
just too much for any one company. We all had the same challenge, and there was just this galvanizing moment, right? You know, everybody was saying we're all in it together, right? Uh, literally, we were, right? If, unless the construction industry could sort of like demonstrate leadership and how we could keep our people safe, it could be the whole industry would be shuttered, right? So it was yeah. critical for us. Yeah, that's that's really cool. And um, I, yeah, I mean, we'll uh, go back and look in the bright, in bright idea to see whose idea it was, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> uh, Hamza, um, how how has uh, COVID changed the way that you guys are uh, partnering with other companies and the way that you're innovating? Um, and how are you able to do this in the AEC space when so many other companies are struggling um, to partner with Fultz in their own space and, and uh, drive innovation? Yeah, and I think I think the biggest part of this, you know, collaboration between AEC industry partners is, is like the industry in general hasn't been digitized, right? And it hasn't been technologically advanced. So there's a collection of all these, you know, innovation people in the different companies that are not only excited about moving their company, but are they excited about moving the whole industry, right? And that's kind of how we get together. Um, uh, we meet like in conferences and, and, and all kind of other gatherings and get to know each other. And then it becomes like, hey, let's let's hold a, a, a bi-weekly or even monthly, sometimes quarterly calls, just to just to compare notes, right? And this is. All goes back to like what's out there with the with the abundance of, of technology providers, solutions providers out there. Um, let's talk to each other, right? Let's see what worked for you at DPR, what worked for you at Black and Beach, what worked for us at Haskell, and take notes. Yeah, and, and it's not really, you know, saying anything bad about companies that didn't work out for for Haskell, for example. It just it might mean like the the type of projects wasn't the right one, the right fit for that specific solution. So it's all about comparing notes, and that's kind of how we uh, started talking to to Ryan and Kashal and uh, um, David Burns at, at McCarthy, and just like COVID hit, and there's like there's so many companies they're not only popping up in this space that says, "Hey, we've solved the COVID solution for construction," but also there are companies that we were already talking to and piloting that are pivoting <laughs> their solution to address COVID-related issues. Uh, and so it was just too much for, for one person or even one company to to look at all these solutions and pilot all those different things and, and then come up with, you know, a structured way of saying this worked, this didn't. So that's why we kind of formed that coalition um, in order to start sharing those, you know, experiences and learn together so that, again, we, we're moving the industry together. Us, uh, the owners, the, the trade partners and the technology solution providers, so all of us. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, the real driving factor here was the uh, the COVID crisis, right? And and everyone wanting to unite together and um, seeing the ability to uh, collaborate and, and overcome uh, things together. We're all in it together, right? So um, I don't know, Kaushal, uh, uh, if that's how you guys felt at DPR, but um, since it was your idea, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, maybe where you see things going um, post COVID, right? With with these kinds of partnerships. Yeah, I, you know, thanks, Ryan. I think it was, I don't know, maybe it was a collective idea. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> I can't take full credit for that. I, I think the uh, the concepts that have already been mentioned, you know, focusing around a common set of problems that we were all facing, and most importantly, addressing safety on our job sites. I think that's what brought us together. You know, and the other factors, you know, mentioned some of the other names on the call, you know, like Dave Burns and I think Rick Kahn was another, you know, advocate. You know, we've had these kind of roundtables before, right, that we are openly sharing. But I think, you know, the COVID experience allowed us to drop some of our walls and realize that, you know, this is a process. There's no secret sauce here. So we, you know, the the same thermal camera company that's knocked on Ryan's door and Hamza's door is also knocking on my door. So why can't we just create a funnel? that allows us to streamline these things and get to the right solution quicker, right? And that was mainly the concept behind Next Coalition. You know, moving forward, what this has helped me understand and realize is that, you know, some of these challenges are not unique to DPR. They're not unique to Haskell or McCarthy or, or you know, Black and & Beach. And all it takes is a quick phone call to say, hey, guys, I'm facing this challenge. Are you guys facing this challenge? And then collaborate freely, right? We don't have to share strategy or, or what each of our companies are doing that's confidential, but the same time we can learn from each other by sharing these ideas and openly collaborating you know and so 
that's that's kind of what I take away from you know post COVID and how do we collaborate together outside of this. Nice. Yeah, and I'd say like one thing that COVID definitely accelerated is our ability to meet remotely. So <laughs> hopefully the free flowing of these ideas um, and sharing and collaboration will continue into the future. Um, great. Well, we're coming up to our last uh, topic of the day, but this one is especially uh, important for those folks that will be listening to this session. But um, any advice that you guys would have, if you could go back in time three to five years and speak to your former self uh, about your innovation program, what, what, what advice would you give to yourself? Um, this could be pre-COVID, um, you know COVID's coming, what would you encourage yourself to invest in, um, in terms of uh, focus going forward? And yeah, anybody that wants to jump in, jump in. Uh, this is open to everyone. I think uh, anybody could use this advice. Um, so yeah, whoever whoever wants to field this one, go for it. Yeah, to me, it would be to um, really aggressively jump on those ideas that or we've we've validated the problem, we validated the solution works, and and scale those winners as fast as we possibly can. I think we probably have been too timid in sort of like incremental thinking, like hey, we did one this worked here, let's go do it like 10% more, you know, how you do it times 100 type type thinking. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of a growth challenge. I think in general, people are, people think about their own context and what they can do as an individual. And maybe they think about like, hey, if I like hired like another person or something to do my job, but it really needs to be more like if, if I was going to create a whole new company, to dominate this space, you know, what would that organization look like, right? It would, it's a different sheet of paper you're starting on. It's a much larger canvas. So um, that type of thinking, I think, is, is challenging. Um, yeah. It has been for me, and I think our team, to really, like, think about, like, bigger picture opportunities. Yeah, it sounds it sounds really uh, interesting, kind of like an uh, incubator uh, and scaling uh, accelerator model. Um, maybe like even carve out companies like the Google Moonshot uh, model. So um, that thinking is is really uh, large and scary for a lot of people. Um, but I think that's a, a great tip, Ryan, to be able to, you know, incubate things quickly, pick winners and scale them and then consider like what would a complete new company look like, right? If you if you were to uh, try to start from scratch and, and dominate the space, Elon Musk, it, as you said earlier. <laughs> so um, Hamza, what would what would your tip be to your former self? Um, fail early and fail fast. Right? <laughs> That's it's kind of like a, a, a known kind of R&D thing. But when we started, it was like so afraid of fall, failing, right? You don't want to fail an initiative that you just started. So we were like, wait, let's let's try to set it up for success. Are we sure this is the right way? So I think that's that's a very important lesson that we learned very quickly that, no, you're supposed to fail. So you know what works and what doesn't and keep moving, right? As long as you keep moving and keep innovating because innovation again is a mindset it's not like yeah we implemented x we're innovative no it's it, you have to keep you have to keep following and, and checking what's next right because there's just the amount of technology providers out there right now it's it's immense and they are changing every day as well um yeah. so it's just it's it's constantly cha chasing that um excellence that you might not achieve but that's the process right it's like you have to get there yeah i know i think that's a great tip especially for people who are just starting an innovation program to uh understand you're going to fail a lot more than you're going to succeed and embrace that and celebrate it right celebrate the failure um what, what do they say in the military uh kashal embrace the suck or <laughs> i think that's what they say. <laughs> but I'm uh, I'm I'm just joking. But yeah, I mean, like you have to embrace the failure because that means you're doing something right, right? You took a chance, uh, you learned from it, and uh, you're on to the next opportunity. So awesome tip, Hamza. Uh, what would your tip be to your former self, Kashal? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know if the military likes failures, so I you know <laughs> try not to fail much in the military. 
I, I definitely echo what both these guys are saying. You know, I think Hamza, you're spot on. You have to create that cultural mindset, right? That makes people feel like it's not really a failure. You're just, it's, what, what did you learn from it? Right. So instead of changing the dialogue from, you know, success or failure to say, Hey, what's, what's the lessons learned here? You know, uh, Ryan uh, brought up a really important top, you know, uh, note there as well, that how do you uh, quickly adopt something when you know it works? You know, a challenge for organizations our size is that once you know something works to scale it and adopt it, it takes a long time. So increasing that speed, you know, to, to the users and, and adopting the tool is something that I'd, I'd like to you know focus on and, and learn more. I think uh, a note to myself would be listening more. Uh, because it's easy to get distracted, you know, by a shiny object to understand, again, sifting through the noise and what is it really that you're trying to solve? I, I think, you know, that's what I would uh, tell myself. And also, you know, if I'm, I didn't have a beard five years ago, so I tell myself, <laughs> hey, invest in some good beard products. I think that's, you know, <laughs> it's something I would <laughs> nice. tell myself. Yeah, I think um, the discipline, right, of being able to not get distracted by that next shiny object is very difficult to uh, instill upon yourself. And it's a great tip because it's happened to everybody, right? We've all been distracted by that next shiny thing that's out there. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate uh, all of the advice that you all shared today uh, for others in your space. I think that it's going to be um, immensely helpful for those people who are uh, trying to start an innovation program, want to partner with other folks, uh, you know, don't really know what they're getting themselves into yet, right? But I think um, as this space grows and matures, more and more folks want this kind of advice. And I really, really appreciate you all uh, being so so gracious with your advice and your tips for everybody else. But yeah, and if you, if you don't mind me adding one more thing is, sure, whoever's out there trying to start a new innovation group, just reach out to any of us. We're Absolutely. always more and, and willing and happy to to chime in and actually sit, share closer experiences uh, as, as, as you're forming that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And if you all uh, want to reach out to Hamza, Ryan, or Kushal, please uh, feel free to contact us at Bright Idea. We'd be happy to put you in touch with all of them. Uh, they all have LinkedIn profiles as well. I'm sure you can, you can find each one of them. But hey, guys, uh, be careful what you ask for. You may be, you may be Insta famous soon. But um, thanks again for all, all of the advice today. I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, as we say at Bright Idea, happy innovating. <laughs> Thank you.